Last night, I had a dream. I sat on a high cloister wall with three men. Below was a pool of water. The water was slimy and I desperately wanted to run away. From an opposite wall, a man reached across to help me over. I lost my balance and fell. I tried to lift my head out of the water, but I became too exhausted. I awoke suddenly, gasping for breath, as that awful stench pushed heavy against my lungs. Because my husband never gratified me sexually, I thought the fault was his. I longed for a sweetheart and found him. He was an athletically built army officer. I visited him at his home. We had intercourse three times. I felt nothing save the desire for gratification. All the time I thought, now, now, now it's coming but it didn't. I went home, broken up and feeling miserable. I felt sullied and humiliated. First I thought of pouring kerosene over my dress and setting fire to myself. I must be on fire for once. Case number 149. As a young child, Emily preoccupied herself inordinately with fire. She would stand in front of a stove and stare absent-mindedly into the flames and was happy when she heard the flames crackling and hissing. One day her mother saw her taking a burning match into her mouth. Quote, I wanted to find out whether it would keep burning. End quote. She collected matchbooks and candles which she would steal from neighbors. Her fantasy was to have someone hold a lighted candle over her so that the molten sterin should dribble on her hand. For her birthday, her greatest desire was for a cake with burning candles. But above all, she wanted for her dolls a little lamp which could be filled with oil and lit. Quote, I would have gladly renounced all other gifts if that one wish would be granted. End quote. My husband discovered my adultery and we were divorced. I became a drifting individual drunkard and a prostitute. I was often called upon by an inspector who would initiate sex with a woman only after her hands were dirtied. At 12 years of age, Emily fell in love with a young boy. Late one afternoon, she hastened back to school, for she knew that he was cleaning the classroom. He chased her away with a broom. That humiliation she never forgot. She unsuccessfully sought his attention for months on end. Emily remembers that the boy had wonderfully long and muscular legs, and she often fantasized about touching them. Fate was kind to her. One day, the boy fell on the ground, suffering from an epileptic seizure. Emily was told by the teacher to hold the boy's ankles. Disregarding the command, Emily placed herself on top of him, pressing his legs tightly between her thighs. The indulgence led to great excitation throughout her body, but she did not achieve sexual acme. After the incident, Emily held a feeling of deep shame and regret. Quote, for years I was haunted by that day on the playground. Always I have fought the notion of doing something forbidden. 
What allowance would my spirit bless that my body might experience such a simple miracle? End quote. suffering from moods of depression. All physicians had told her that this weakness resulted from her excessive drinking and smoking. None were able to help her overcome her addictive behaviors. She sought my aid as a hypnotist to overcome the latter. Emily smoked 60 to 70 cigarettes in a 24-hour period. She even has the habit of smoking at night, being urged by desire to get up every hour for a smoke. I decided that the best treatment for Emily would be to reduce her addiction slowly. During our first session, it was suggested to her that she would no longer be able to smoke in bed. The following week, Emily reported to me that while she was unable to smoke in bed, she was compelled to leave her bed each hour in order to take a smoke. The subsequent suggestion given to her was that she must not smoke between the hours of 10 p.m. and 8 a.m. Although Emily had attained the desired result, she regained the omitted number of cigarettes during her waking hours and thus her daily consumption remained the same. I decided that a different approach was in order, and as Emily slipped into the hypnotic state for the third and last time, I sought an answer to her past. She informed me that after the divorce, a condition of restlessness with insomnia appeared and during the sleepless nights she acquired the habit of smoking. But she has deceived herself. She still loves her husband very much, and it was he who had forcibly torn himself away from her. She could not, however, banish the memory of his kisses from her mind, and the cigarettes were to cover up her burning desire for those kisses. I suggested a new course for her. You must place the divorce in your past. Seek out a new life. Seek out another partner, a gentleman with similar interests. A new life, Emily. A new life. So long as I was but slightly drunk, I was able to fight off the notion of setting fires. But when I kept on drinking, the impulse became so powerful that I would have done it even if the muzzle of a gun had been leveled at me. On one such night, I met a painter. In your mind, you sweat, salty and rough, calamities rise, calamities fall. You mortify flesh for the cure. I guess it's something to do. Please don't. My love, you wish to be my ear In your mighty sweat Salty and rum Roast your little mouth Filling me with all Baby, take this from 
Don't you have anything better to do? I've done enough already for one day. Do you draw for a living? I paint, yes. And this is a sketch. A fire must be captured quickly. The only way to accomplish this task is in this manner. And it requires a great deal of concentration. Why don't you just take a photograph? A photograph? I'll tell you why I won't bother to take a photograph. Because I am an artist. A painting is a work of art. What you see here is a building block, the necessary groundwork to achieve my objective. A timeless, fiery perspective that can only be captured by the hand of a true craftsman. Have you ever been to a museum? Have you ever seen a display of photographs in a museum? <laughs> no, never. Do you know where you will find photographs on public display? Coney Island. Penny postcards. Images of Siamese twins and bearded ladies. There is your medium. Photography is, quite simply put, George Eastman's gift to the Bowery. suffered from the mania of grandeur. He thought he was the greatest painter on earth. His specialty was painting fires. He thought none other could paint so well a conflagration with its glowing flames as he. Every time he thinks of fire and of saving a very young girl from the flames. The girl is naked. He rushes into the burning home finds her unconscious and carries her out of the house in the midst of a thunderous applause of the multitude. He covers her with his mantle while she kisses him, murmuring, My Savior! My Savior! the very essence of God's fury on canvas. Hellfire, my dear! Hellfire! How much of the money do you keep as your own? Not much. Here, take this, please. I'll keep your money. You're a fool. Why don't you come to my home? Then you'd be able to keep all of the money. I tell you stories because that is what Madame pays me to do. If I didn't have to talk with you, I wouldn't. These stories may be more beneficial to you than you realize. 
Your stories may also help others with similar difficulties. What do you know of my difficulties? You know nothing. You think you know quite a lot, don't you? Do you really want to know what I think? You are no different than any one of my customers. You pay for something you need, something you cannot get at home. You use women, same as all the rest. Quite a few of my clients are men. Well, do not think of me as one of your clients. You are paying me. You are my client. I do have a need, and only you can fulfill that need. Will you help me, Emily? Let's get back to your childhood. You told me once that your greatest birthday wish was to have a cake brimming with burning candles. Yes? Various accounts of morbid arson by young women show that the bed was first set afire. Quote, I want him to be on fire for me. End quote. I sought the help of an old acquaintance. After careful negotiations, we agreed upon an exchange his cultivated and perverted curiosity for my shame. Ice water filled his veins as much as it did mine. We were a perfect match. Eventually, he would go on to publish a book. Over the course of time, no less than seven volumes would bear his name. Years later, I purchased the volume which revealed my case. My entire life story had been condensed to a few demented paragraphs. The analysis of my psychosis, on the other hand, filled several pages. Although I would finally come to understand my morbid obsessions, I would ultimately fail to achieve my one, my only, true desire. I must be on fire for once. 